Today's April 22nd. The Pirates are 500 again. Back-to-back sweeps. It feels like it's not April. But the season goes on, and so does the show. Special guest today, guys. Let's talk baseball. You're listening to the Bridge to Bucktober podcast. Yins guys, thank you for listening to the Bridge to Bucktober podcast where we talk all about them Pittsburgh Pirates and that. My name is Josh and I'm joined this week by one half of the 3 Take podcast, Red Sox fan Kyle Corwin. Kyle, thanks for coming on, man. How's it going? It's going well, man. Um, I apologize that uh, we're having this conversation on the heels of a, a sweep, but uh, you know, it's like we're talking about, it's a long season. There's a lot more baseball left to be played. And I... I know, based on our, our chat before we we hopped on, that you that you understand that you've got a pulse on the fact that you know that there's no reason to cry. Like we're you, pirates, pirates are gonna be all right. That's it. They're gonna be all right. We hope. <laughs> I you know I thought about that a little bit and I was like, okay, well, we were talking about you coming on. I was like, okay, it's the only chance we we play Boston. Let me throw this out there. Jake's work schedule sometimes has him working Saturdays. Thursdays, we don't really, or Sundays or Thursdays, so we don't know. And I was like, well, I knew he was off Thursday. I was like, I'm going to get him for Sunday if he can do it, because that'd be better in case he can't be here. And then midway through game two, I was like, man, we should have done a, we should have done a preview. Preview episode, yeah. (laughs) No, I mean, look, it, uh, I was not optimistic uh, coming into this series. I, I I did not feel good. Um, the Red Sox have been playing very um, unfundamental baseball, if that's a word. We're gonna make it a word. It's it just has not been good. Errors. I I have yet to check as of uh, today, Sunday. Um, where we stand in terms of errors, but I believe last I checked, well, last I checked, we were leading the league in, in errors and I'm I'm sure we're probably still near at the top even though we played a, a little bit better of a series but you know it seemed like the pirates took took the narrative they took the baton from the Red Sox and and they were playing uh, a little bit on the the nervous lacking confidence side and I think it showed in this series yeah and that's what that's what we've been that's what we've been talking about a lot uh, just on the side. This whole, really not even the the Mets series as much, but it felt like, oh, you need to bounce back against Boston, and the complete opposite happened. And it just felt like the wheels fell off. And so that's exactly... But yeah, I was watching and I was like, man, you know what? I'm so... Like, I have these blinders on that just look at all these mistakes that the Pirates are making. And I was like, this is actually good because... I would like to know what Boston looks like right now. Like, are they even playing well in comparison? And it seems like they had they they were actually. It was like the the tale of two stories where you guys kind of righted it, and that's what we're hoping we can get to. Yeah, I mean, if they're, I, I hate to say it again, following a sweep, but if there was going to be a, a team to right the ship against, I feel like the Red Sox would have been the team to do it against because. <laughs> Honestly, I I don't know what I don't know what happened on the flight to Pittsburgh or what, but something something uh, a switch was flipped, and they just I mean that game uh, what was it game I think it was game one four homers in game one, um very very minimal if any mistakes really I I think that was their most complete game of the season I know they were talking about it on the broadcast uh, as I was watching, and that seemed to be. That seemed to be the the sentiment in the clubhouse the next day, and I think I think uh, Alex Cora, manager, echoed that same sentiment that you know, like that that was a good way to to start the series, and um, it it kind of they they just built off that momentum for throughout the rest of the weekend. But yeah, something something must have happened on the flight. Um, they 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 locked in, they dialed in for the series, and uh, hopefully we can we can take advantage of a nice off day and uh, roll into Cleveland and, and keep keep moving. It doesn't get easier for either team, uh, <laughs> as, as, we'll, as we'll, uh, we'll talk about. But 
Uh, yeah, and Friday was so Marco Gonzalez. Actually, a couple things I can bring up here. Marco Gonzalez is going to go without throwing for a couple of weeks at all. So there's no surgery. They don't think. They say they're just being overly cautious with a guy who has uh, a history <laughs> of of some injuries. So I take it as you will. That's either it's either you know lip service or it's the truth. I don't know. But we don't know how long that's going to be. So Quinn Priester's probably going to get even another look, maybe two more. I don't really know how long that's going to be. Jason DeLay also had knee surgery to repair right meniscus. Six weeks till baseball activities, which makes our catching situation really interesting. Uh, We talked about that on Thursday, so you can go back and listen to that. But yeah, I I told you I had something I wanted to kind of say about all of this at the beginning. And so I I will kind of say this piece because I know there's a lot of Pirate fans that will listen to this wanting to hear certain things. And uh, so I'm just going to say that if you want to listen to someone who's going to whine and cry about what happened this week, there's plenty of fans out there that'll do that for you. Um, That's not what this show is. That's not what this show's about. Uh, I'm going to analyze it, call it the way I see it, but I'm not going to like it happened and that's the way it goes. And that's baseball. The Diamondbacks were eight and 16 last July, fell down to 500 as, as late as August 8th and were two days, two games under 500 back to 500 on August 15th and made it to the world series. I'm not trying to say the pirates are going to the world series. I'm just saying to give up in April seems uh, we just dropped to 500, right? That's the point. And it's like, it's April. Um, a, a team who's played poor so far this season, and in, in, in my opinion, throughout the whole season, even while we were winning, I didn't think we were playing complete games. And to to give up in April is silly. I don't know. I guess to be fair, my preseason prediction was like seventy eight wins. So for them to be at five hundred, I'm kind of like I expected to see some of this this season, but I still think this year will be a step forward. And if it bugs you to watch the Pirates, guys, uh, there's 140 more games. Turn the game off. Go do something outside. Have a good day. There's plenty more to watch. When they get good, tune the game back in. Listen to listen to our podcast. Listen to all these other podcasts out there. We'll tell you when they're going good. And, <laughs> and then, you know, go from there. But it's a long season. And you hate to see it. And that was not enjoyable baseball by the home team this weekend. But like that doesn't mean that it's that that the season's over and they're not going to get better. That I say this, the roster this year. And you guys look at every team on your show, right? The roster this year is better than the roster last year. And specifically even better than I mean you think of like the starting pitching at the end of the season last year, we had Keller and Oviedo and uh, who knows? that nobody else was doing well and they were over 500 for those for that stretch of of having two starting pitchers I just think that and and now we have O'Neill Cruz who looks lost right now but like you if you think that this roster is not as good as last year's I don't don't know I don't know what we're looking at so I I don't know if you see that when you looked at the team uh this offseason I know there wasn't a ton of like great moves but like you, you said before, uh, having Martin Perez is it could be worse. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I think you're right. I think objectively, looking at looking at the Pirates' uh, roster construction this year, I think is again objectively better than it was last year. But unfortunately, uh, in regards to last year, I I do kind of have a take that I just kind of formulated as I was listening to you talk about that. I think. The more the more I think about it, I think the twenty and eight start last year maybe was the worst thing to happen to the Pirates <laughs> to start the season last year because we saw how it. I mean, certainly no team would argue against starting twenty and eight. That's not what I'm saying, but when you look at the way that the Pirate season finished up last year, when you see the fall off that took place, the problem with that is now when you have a Pirates team that's 500 after 22 games, you're going to have the Pirates, you're going to have that that percentage of Pirates fans that 
will irrationally look at that and go, well, if we if we went 20 and 8 to start the year last year and we ended up the way we did, what makes you think that this year is going to be any better? It's like, well, baseball it, it's a it's a funny game. It works in mysterious ways at times. And just because you're starting 500 through 22 games does not mean that you're going to end up worse off. It's possible. I mean, anything's possible in baseball. Right. But because of the uh, the pieces that you have in place this year, um, I I I personally feel better about the Pirates. That I feel better this year than I did last year, and, and I talked about that. We do a we do a hot takes and predictions episode to start each year. And we usually release it like the week uh, of opening day. And we had a um, friend of the show, Ryan Ripkin on, big Orioles guy, as you would imagine. And it was the three of us, me, Ryan, and Nate, uh, talking about the NL Central. And I think, if I recall, I was the only one that was even remotely optimistic about what the Pirates were, were capable of doing. And, and I, I believe I had them finishing in third in the Central uh, but I think that was still higher than where the other two had them. But, you know, I, I think if, um, if you can get a guy like, like O'Neill Cruz going, who had one of, if not the best spring trading of, of anybody out there, yeah. uh, if you can get him going, um, you're, you guys will be fine. It's, it, it it's a, it's sir, both, honestly, both centrals, if you really think about it, American League and National League, they're both really up for grabs on an annual basis. So mm -hmm. if you can just, um, if you can find a, find a seam, you can, you can maintain a little bit of momentum and not get too streaky. Uh, re again, referring to that 20 and eight start, if, if you can f maintain a little bit more consistency um, and not be so up and down. I think, I think you guys will be all right. Yeah. I think that's a lot of it. O'Neill Cruz, uh, in particular, since you, uh, we brought him up, he, he looks lost. It, it is a, an obvious sign of someone who, I mean, he played nine games last year. He's, it almost feels to me like he can't, he doesn't have the ability right now to slow the game down. Everything is happening so fast, and I feel like he is uh, possibly overthinking it, overanalyzing it, thinking, you know what I mean, uh, whatever it is. But uh, it's it's not been pretty. It's swinging at bad pitches, which I'm actually like, there's a little bit of O'Neill Cruz in me that, like, there's a little bit of, uh, of me that when he sees O'Neill Cruz swinging at bad pitches, I'm like, hey, that's kind of okay. Because I've seen him golf balls that you shouldn't even be able to hit out of the, out, you know. And so, like, there's a little bit of, I don't mind some chase. But a guy like him, I said in our uh, in our hot takes episode, I said 40 homers. And that was the hot take, right? But I thought, Fangraphs had him at 24, and I think he can accidentally hit 24. And I guess the accidents, what I mean is he's got three home runs right now. I would call two of them accidents. And I say that because if anybody else would have taken that swing on that ball, it would have been caught. And so that's kind of where I'm at. So he's got two accidental home runs right now. And the rest of, you know, I just think that like he taking strike three and he leads the team in called strike three. That just can't happen. And it just seems to be a guy who is either guessing and being totally fooled or, or, or it's the offensive approach that's, that's got him so confused that he doesn't know what to do. He's, he's just – the offensive approach from hitting coach Andy Haynes is take, 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 take. There's a lot of it that makes sense. Get a pitcher to throw – a starter to throw a lot of pitches so you can get to the bullpen early. All of that stuff is fine. Um, the guy, Jack Sawinski, I think, who does it well, coincidentally, isn't doing it this year. He's attacking everything, and uh, and I think it's hurting him. But, like, I, I, he does it well by saying, I'm going to pick my pitch, and the aggressiveness that you see from him is, I'm going to attack that pitch, be aggressive, and hit the one that I'm good at hitting. And sometimes you get you have a lot of strikeouts when you have that approach. 
And that's exactly what's going on. With, but it's all across the board, the entire team, except for Jack Swinsky, who's lowered his strikeout rate in half. And it's almost like, I'd, I'd like you to strike out a little bit more. Everybody else, I'd like you to strike out less. But O'Neill Cruz in particular is one that I'm like, you can't just sit around and wait. You can hit anything out. You don't have to wait for your pitch. And I mean, we lead the league. It's not even close. I don't think we lead the league in called strike three. It's bad. Well, I, I think you're onto something there and, and it doesn't seem to be much of a mystery in terms of him being lost at the plate. I'm, I'm looking at numbers right now. He we're only 22 or the pirates at least are only 22 games into the season. He's got a 15 strikeout margin over the next closest guy, Michael A. Taylor. O'Neill Cruz, 37. Michael A. Taylor got 22. Um, and it's not, it, it's, it's not just that. He's not, it, it doesn't seem as though he's seeing pitches. And that's really what it starts with. When these guys start to lose it a little bit at the plate, they're not seeing the ball. Uh, it starts with with taking some walks, seeing seeing deeper counts, getting a little more uh a little more confident at the plate but i mean he's got an on base in the mid twos 261 so it's not like he's he's even really finding ways to to get on base otherwise um but yeah that's a guy that you you need to to go and i think if if uh, a guy like O'Neill Cruz, who's capable of providing some buzz for a franchise such as the Pirates. I think if if you can get him going, get the team back over the 500 hump, because um, I know you guys are sitting there right now. But if you can if you can add a little cushion there, get get the city buzzing a little bit, get Skeens up there. Mm. I I'm telling you, there there's just look. And I, I wanted to open with this, but just a, a thought on the Pirates in general. To, to the Pirates fans out there, I, I want you to rest assured. I want you to be able to go to bed at night knowing that you guys have, yins have. There you go. As, as I tap into my, uh, my, my mother's side of the family, Southwest PA uh, dialect there. You guys have something that many, many organizations, fan bases wish they had. And that's one, a city that cares about their sports. And I know there's a divide when it comes to the Steelers and, and the pirates. And I know there, there's a little bit of a discussion to be had there, but in general, you have a city that cares about your sports. You have what I think is one of the more underrated aspects or elements of the pirates is you're all the, the color scheme and the branding. They're so one of the best in baseball that I've ever seen. So you've got that working for you. The, the pirate theme in general, I think is fantastic. You've got young talent here. You've got young talent on the way up. There's, there's just so much to be, um, I don't. I don't want to say grateful for because it, when I if if I say that, then it just makes it seem like no, you guys have this. No, no, accept it, like it, enjoy it, and shut up. Who cares about how many games you win? I understand that you also want to win on top of all those other things, but just just rest assured that the foundation is there at least. And and I I think ownership, uh, maybe making some changes in the front office, I, I think are are some things that are to be desired. <laughs> by by prize fans so i get that uh but it's it's not the end of the world that we you, you and i were talking before we hopped on there there is light at the end of the tunnel don't know how long that tunnel is but it there it it's there it's certainly there yeah i like that thank you um i love the the color scheme too so that's a good it's thing. it's i mean it's it's one of the best but i i understand when when I have when I have my uncle telling me every time we go up to visit family, he goes, We're the we're the farm system for major league baseball. When so I, I understand that hearing that your team has a great color scheme probably doesn't do much yeah. to 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 fix that pain <laughs> at all. I understand that. Yeah. But just from an outsider's perspective, just know that from my point of view, looking at what the pirates have, there's there's what I believe is momentum building. Um, I mean, you guys are making the right steps, extending Brian, uh, O'Neill Cruz. Like I said, if you can get him going, that's going to be the, 
talk about an electric factory. Um, Brian Reynolds, you know, Paul Skeens, I already mentioned yeah. him. The, it's the, the pieces are there. Yeah. And I, I mean, we don't know Skeens timeline, right? He threw his last outing was 65 pitches. They're, they're taking it, um, very cautiously slow. The, the thing, the thing is with Skeens is he's never pitched on five days rest. Like he's never pitched it like college. You pitch once a week. And so they're trying to just say, let's get this rhythm of being in a five man rotation. Let's get you used to that. And then, uh, and then when that, when they feel like that is there and they just keep increasing pitches, like it was 55 and then it, I think it was 44, then 55, then 65. So it's actually kind of gone, you know, 10 each. So you could, I think he's due to start, it was Thursday. So I think Wednesday's his day with the day off on Monday. Um, I mean, if he goes 75 pitches, at that point, I'm kind of like, if you're comfortable with 75, like you just took Jared Jones out of the game at 59 pitches, you could go 75 and, and get him here. I think they'll give Quinn Priester another look. But if he's really bad, I don't know. Like, are we looking at the, the? I don't know how it lines up. I'm trying to think with like, with Marco's spot, which is now Priester's spot, I think it would line up to be the first like Sunday of May. So is that the uh, MLB pipeline, I think wrote, they thought it would be May 3rd. So that would probably fit with that. I think it's, I think third is the Friday. So, and it's the Rockies. So maybe, maybe a good go. recipe right there is let's start off with someone like that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, Skeens and Jones in a rotation and, and Keller's got to get going. He's still quite, uh, he's not quite where he needs to be. But if you could get those three guys in a rotation, I, I just that we haven't had that in quite a while. And so I, I think that's going to go a long way. However, if the offense scores one or two runs a game, it might not matter. And that's what they're doing right now. Uh, I want to ask you what you saw because there was like a moment. The Pirates signed Rowdy Telez, and I was like, oh, man, what are we doing? And then he kind of like over the spring, he kind of grew on you a little bit. And it got to this point where I even said, hey, I think I like having this guy here. Everything he hit at the beginning of the year was 112 miles an hour. There weren't as many of them, but you felt like it's about to happen. Well, it like didn't happen. And then it's gotten worse. Like when you... <laughs> Knowing like the course of the season, and a lot of a lot of uh, fans here are getting a little uh, impatient with that, with Telez. What do you see from? I mean, obviously you've been watching him <laughs> for years now. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's unfair to expect a whole lot out of Telez. I mean, I I don't know what what part of his track record would lend you to believe that he's capable of, of meeting these expectations that pirates fans may have. Um, he's going to be a guy, honestly, I, I think you've already seen um, one of the more valuable aspects of him as a player and, and his ability to step up on my, on behalf of his teammates and be a voice uh, for a guy like David Bednar in the the incident in the, the locker room that uh, took place recently with the uh, post game presser, but I I think he's just going to be a he's going to be a placeholder. Um, I I don't I don't think it makes sense to put too much stock into what he does. I think you need to hope for more out of the rest of that lineup so that you're not putting. I I don't think there's a scenario in which it makes sense that you're your bank. And when I say you, I don't mean you, I just mean pirates fans. I, I, I don't think there's a, a scenario in which it makes sense that your, your faith in the outcome of a given game hinges on what Rowdy Telez does. I, I just, especially with, I, I would say any team really, that would be the case. But I think, especially with the pirates, you look around, they, they've got some dudes that I think need to carry the burden that they're capable of carrying. And, um, that way you're not 
you're not asking yourself, well, what if what if Rowdy had done this at the plate in a in a game, or what if Rowdy had made that play? It's like, well, Rowdy's Rowdy's not the he's not the guy that you should be looking to in the first place. There's other, I mean, heck, even McCutcheon, who's in the the, the tail end of his career. Like I would I would be looking to a guy like McCutcheon before I look to a guy like Rowdy Teles. Yeah, and there's and, and it's up and down the lineup right now too. When you when you look at who's struggling and who's doing good and who's there and who's not and all that stuff. Uh, one of the things I'll say about uh, Boston, just to go back to Boston for a second, we saw Tristan Casas uh, was in his swing. Is yeah, it was a. I think officially it went down as like a a rib strain, which. Uh, you could give me a hundred guesses. I don't think I could accurately tell you what exactly a rib strain is. I didn't know you could <laughs> strain a rib. I, I I genuinely don't know what that means. I know that it's not good. I know that he uh, re- reports came out that said he he shared with uh, Cora that he was not he was not feeling great. And Alex Cora is a guy who is more times than not gonna gonna try to put a positive spin on 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 news such as that but when you have him relaying what what Cassis is saying you can only imagine that it's it's not great and so he got put on i believe the 10 day uh today um so not ideal the the list of injuries we have and not even just injuries in terms of IL sense but just guys being banged up and and guys not being mentally there the list goes on and we're only 20 games into the season it's it's alarming the fact that we won the these three games even though it was against a a little bit of a scuffling pirate team i was genuinely blown away at it. i don't know how they pulled off especially with the lineup they rolled out today i i mean that's that's a a double a AA lineup if if i've ever seen one so a bunch of former former pirates i mean what, pablo what, reyes what we, and tyler heideman and uh somebody else went into the game uh, oh, I mean, and Reese are, McGuire. <laughs> yeah, what are we, what are we doing? Um, I don't I don't understand it. But you know, if, if I, baseball is, as we very well know, a game of averages, and with the way that the offense has continuously let down this rotation, which is one of the best, if not the best, in baseball right now, statistic uh, statistic wise, um, I, I think it's. It was a, a breath of fresh air that we were able to pull out some some games for some very well pitched, uh, very well pitched games by our rotation. The fact that we were able to to finally um, secure some wins, some more convincingly than I mean I, that game too was obviously pretty close, but um, it was just good to see good pitching, but also the pitchers get the wins the teams get the wins and just not play stupid baseball like we had been for weeks before. So, Well, I mean, we did get a run off of Cutter Crawford, increasing that ERA to .66. Yeah, I think that's what, his second earned (laughs) run allowed uh, this season? Just incredible. I mean, .66. In our, uh, the 3 take, we we were looking at the, at the time, the top 10 leaders in ERA across all of baseball and... Cutter Crawford was right up there. He, I think, at the time he was maybe second uh, behind. Um, I'm drawing a blank on who was there. He was, but he was t- he was top well, two, Shota, top three. Shota hadn't given up a run until this last. Start. Yeah, I, it was like a. It, it was based on a minimum of. Okay. Uh, I don't remember what the minimum was, but I don't remember if if Shota was on that list. But it was just a bunch of a bunch of no names. Like there wasn't a single, there wasn't really a household name on that list. And, um, Cutter Crawford, I think is a guy that was poised for this type of season. I don't know. I I can't say with confidence that I saw this kind of start coming, but I think the stuff that you're seeing from Cutter Crawford this year, I think will play over the course of a season. Um, and I think that he is going to be a guy that, sooner rather than later is going to be is going to be reeling in uh somewhat of a hefty contract because i think his stuff is legit i don't think this is going to be uh a fluky year for him 
Um, and so it's, it's just good to see him winning these games. That it, well, I, I say winning. I, he, he had prior to this weekend, he hadn't earned a win. Um, and I don't, he, he, he did, did. Get the win. He got yeah, the okay. win. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure he, he went yep, deep enough. One he and oh. Yeah. He hadn't, he hadn't earned a win <laughs> up until this weekend. So, um, you know, it, it's just refreshing to see. And I think if, if this rotation can stay somewhat consistent, I mean, not that they have to be leading all of baseball and, and ERA by any means, but if, if we can, if the rotation can sync up with the offense like they did this weekend and, and both sides of the ball are clicking on all cylinders, because for years it's always been, well, you know, you know, Boston's going to lead the league offensively. That that's just going to be there. It doesn't matter who's in the lineup; they're just going to find ways to manufacture runs, and that's always been the thing. But this start that we've seen, it's 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 just been raising some. It's just been raising some eyebrows. Like the pitching is what seems to be there, and the offense has been lacking. So it was just good. All in all, it was just good to see a weekend where where they they got things clicking on both sides of the ball. Yeah, and Friday. Uh, Brian Bayo did six innings of his own, one hit, seven Ks. The changeup uh, just was filthy. And, I, man, I don't – he's – I hate ERAs really early on anyway, but 304 ERA, I mean, I know that it hasn't been all good, but that's that's what you – that if you could get that from him, uh, the extension is – awesome yeah and and frankly i think if you ask any red sox fan uh they probably would have told you that they would have expected cutter crawford's numbers from bayo uh because he i he's i i genuinely believe he's the real deal i think brian yeah. bayo has potential to be real ace material and uh, Pedro Martinez, obviously former former ace for the Sox, who works with these guys oftentimes, uh, has said himself. He's like when I he goes he said when I look at Brian Bayo I see myself, and that to me that's pretty high praise. And and I know I know Pedro likes to throw compliments around <laughs> left and right at times, but I I genuinely believe he feels that way about Brian Bayo. And if you if you watch him close enough, you can you can see a mini Pedro in the making. I mean, statistically, we'll see. We'll see how that pans out. I, I don't know if if he has the same trajectory, uh, but his stuff has the potential to just be like league leading stuff. Just stuff that I think can can dice up the league. And he just, for me, I think it's a confidence thing. I, I've I've seen some body language early in the year uh, this year that hasn't been all that great. Uh, but he's still young. I know there's there's time for him to to grow up a little bit and to, and to develop into a, a more uh, seasoned arm. Um, but it was it was encouraging to to see him have this start that he did this weekend. Yeah, he uh, he looks for sure like the real deal. So you get like, you know, the the purpose in bringing this up a little bit is like. You, w- we're looking at the Pirates who look lost at the plate, and you combine that with two guys who are essentially going a- as well as you could expect. You, this is the recipe. You needed Sunday. You needed, as a Pirate fan, you needed Sunday. Let's break this. You had five games in a row. You need this game. You need to get it back. And you had a few moments. I mean, you got the early lead. You had a few moments where it was like, this is it. This is where you can do good. And you run yourself out of, I mean, you didn't run yourself out of the inning. Uh, the Hayes was a lead off, right? I think they gave him a single on that, but that's really an error. <laughs> and then if he doesn't run to second, like if he just stays at first, they probably give him an error. But since he tried to run, to, I don't even know. Like what, I the errors and the hits right now are. I'm. I'm the, so glad you brought that up. It's I, so I bad. Could, I could not be more on the conspiracy hype train than I am this season with with all that. I don't know if this is a a league wide initiative behind closed doors. I don't know if Manfred's getting in in these scorekeepers' ears, being like, "Hey, we need to we need to bump," uh, or like, "We need to we need to manipulate the offense this year statistically as as best we can." So I don't know like what's yeah. happening, but the 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 
the scorekeeping has been horrendous this year across the league. I don't know what we it is. We talked about it last year. Just about plays that were like, that's an error. And I don't I don't know how it's not an error. Now, we I was also um on a podcast of another Pirates podcast. And we like we went through this thing talking about errors in general and how if you're looking to see if somebody's good, it's really not even errors that you look at. It, there's a lot of defensive metrics that can tell you whether somebody's good or not. Now, if it's an outlandish number uh, that's high, then obviously that's telling you something. If it's really, really low, that's telling you something. But like in general, errors are going to happen and they're, they are what they are. But going back two weeks and changing a guy's on base streak for whatever reason, that guy didn't score a run. It meant absolutely nothing to change it. And when I watched the play, I was like, I think it was an error. And they, or no, they, I think it was a hit and they changed it to an error. But then even like Jack Sawinski uh, lost it in the sun and it just goes between his glove and his, that's an error. I don't care if he lost it in the sun. I c- let me do that. Let me say, well, he lost it in the sun. I'll give him a pass on that one. If you can't see the ball, you can't catch it. That, that's just common sense, right? If you can't right. see the ball, you're, you're just going to be lucky if you catch it. But that doesn't mean it's not an error. The guy who hit the ball hit a ball that was catchable. It should have been an error. So I don't know. And they, they go back and forth. But at the beginning of last year, they did nice. Didn't know that would happen. Um, <laughs> it's Rob Manfred calling you. He he's on to yeah, us. Yeah, he, he's he on said, to us. Hey, don't hey, don't be throwing <laughs> don't be throwing our secrets out on air like that. That's right. No, they had a they had a meeting at the beginning of last year, in an event or in in the effort to even it out so that like the home scorebook isn't like so like oh well if you were playing in Chicago that would have been a hit but if you're playing in Boston it's going to be an error because of the way that guy does it. They're like, no, 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 we want to make it across the board so that people stop saying that they're inconsistent. And then as a result, they talked about what is an error. And now I'm like, I don't think anybody knows anymore. <laughs> no, and I mean, look, I haven't I mean, I played I played D three baseball. So I can't exactly I can't exactly sit here and talk about it from like a professional point of view. But even even coming through when I was playing baseball. I loved having the whole like, hey, kind of kind of work with your scorekeeper, see if you can get some like home cooking, you know, that, <laughs> like that kind of stuff. But even then, I feel like there was a more objective analysis of the play. They're going, you know, I would love to give you a hit, but I mean, I, I think nine people out of ten are going to say that that's an like that's an error or whatever whatever it ended up being. Um, but now the the threshold for for hits versus errors has to me just been lowered dramatically and it's like we're not even we're not even looking at this with a critical eye we're just going eh you know let's let's give it this or let's give it that and it's i, I don't know like what i don't know what narrative we're trying to push now like i don't know what what adjustment we're trying to make to the game but it's so tra- it's so transparently obvious that that this that an effort is being made to actively uh, push along whatever it is that we're trying to push along because some of these calls are just atrocious. Yeah, I sometimes I'm one. There's even something going on right now, and I, I heard somebody talking about it uh, this past week, where it's like the wild pitch versus the past ball that it's not. It doesn't feel right anymore. Like they're calling it a wild pitch on like like things that really should be a passed ball. And I don't I don't really know what that is. I think it's like, oh, if you get crossed up, it's a wild pitch or something like that. And I'm like, I don't know, I don't know man. Like <laughs> it's just super weird. I listen, I would not be surprised if it was one hundred percent intentional, uh, but we don't need to go down that path. And I know from listening to your show that you like to dabble in the conspiracy theories. So I know that hey, we look, may, we may go long if we get into that. <laughs> look, when you, when you start finding out when, when these reports start coming about, the, about different things, this and that, that show that like, there is some validity to the, these like sports conspiracies. You're like, okay, well, if, if, 
if this thing is is capable of happening, then we can't put it past you know this thing happening or, or this being true. So we, we're not we're not a conspiracy podcast by any stretch. <laughs> like we we try to we try to say somewhat level headed, but we also recognize that like uh, it's not as you know like the league isn't all as buttoned up as they they like to pretend to be. So we just yeah. we try to be a little overly critical when it when it's necessary. Yeah. Not just baseball though. You know what I mean? Now you guys, what was the thing? What was the, uh, for a while there, you guys, it was an off season thing, I think, right? Oh yeah. We do the, uh, we do the, the three Oh change up. So it's like, we're, we're the three Oh take. So in the off season right. we do, we do the three Oh change ups. It's just like a, an off season series where we just do non baseball related, uh, topics and one of the ones we did, uh, or no, rather it was, like it was a series. It, yeah, it was like a, a series within the series where we just dove into all these different conspiracies <laughs> and tell you what, man, the world's a crazy place. And <laughs> like if 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 these things are happening around the world in in governments and in you know just everyday life, who who are we to sit here and pretend that things like this don't happen in baseball? Like. Right. You, Major League Baseball has acknowledged, like, yeah, we we mess with the baseballs and and things let things here and there. So, like, I don't know. I'm <laughs> I'm just uh, I, love I don't it. I don't have much faith in Major League Baseball as an organization, but I, I still sit down and watch it every day. So yeah, uh, it's it's the best. Um. All right. What else do I have here? We're at a good place. Um. How about where we go from here? Because as I said earlier, it's not going to get easier for the Pirates or even the Red Sox. So the start with the Red Sox there. You just finished up with with Cleveland in Boston and lost three out of four. And that was kind of what you were saying, like, this is what it looked like, exactly what the Pirates looked like this weekend. And so now you got to go to Cleveland for three and they're just, they're, they're rolling. I will say the one thing that I am encouraged by, and it this shouldn't be the case. Like you should just play better baseball at home. I I believe that. I think that should just be the the default, the standard. But clearly, the Red Sox don't want to take that route this year. They say no, we're <laughs> going to be road warriors. They're they're ten and three on the road. Um, and on honestly, I think part of that is uh, this is a young hodgepodge group of guys. Oh. I think. I think there's a an added pressure when they get when they get to Fenway and they start pressing. I think yeah. um I, I I don't know if that's the reason. I don't know if that if that fully explains their their struggles at home. But it they I'm telling you, watching them on the road, it's a completely different team. And I know I just got done talking about how for like two weeks they they looked like a, a little league team, but even then, they still, at the very least, even if they're making stupid mistakes, they they at least look a little bit looser, um, and they just feel like they or they look like they they feel a little bit more relaxed. So I am I am encouraged by that. Um, hopefully they can again. Hopefully they can build off this momentum uh, from the series sweep on the road. They can take it to Cleveland and and build off that a little bit. Um, but it's it's the injuries, man. It's that's mm -hmm. regardless. What momentum you build up, regardless what your your home road splits are, if you don't have guys out there on a consistent basis, it's it's tough uh, to overcome that. And I just I just don't know. I, I've said for the last probably I mean two seasons before this, basically post twenty twenty one when they made that ALCS run. Every, each each of the 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 following three seasons, I, I've started every year saying there's so much that has to go right for this Red Sox team, and I just don't see it all coming together the way it has to, resulting in a, a whatever a postseason run, uh, a trip to the AL, uh, another trip to the ALCS or or what have you, uh, and that's been the case. I mean, we're staring down the 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 barrel of a third straight last place finish in the AL East and I I know last place in the American League East doesn't mean the same as last place in another division I mean you yeah uh, you could you could finish close to 500 in last place in the American League East just because of how um 
stacked it is at times and just honestly how how bloody that division can get over the course of a season uh but regardless they they're aware of what division they play in they know what has to what has to be done in order to not finish in last place and again going back to the injuries if if we can't field a, a respectable team that's that's kind of where we're headed but i'm i'm not throwing in the towel yet um i i will say that this year as a red sox fan i think has been the most roller coastery i've ever been more times than not i'm usually like all right let's let's dial it back but i'm <laughs> i'm um if if you were to classify me as as a meme i'm <laughs> i'm that meme where it's it's like the in the midst of saying it's over, I found like a we're back, like one of those types <laughs> of means. And that's literally me. Like I'll, I'll just, I'll go to bed after a loss and I'll be like, why do I even care about this team? Th yeah. This team is a joke. And then I'll wake up the next day. I'll be, I'll be blasting Tessie like a full volume and I'll, I'll be so amped for the game that night and then they'll go out and drop it by like eight runs. And then I'd wake up and do the next, the same thing the next day. But uh, I think a lot of people here can relate. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so, it's been so roller coastery this season. I'm, and like I said, I'm usually not like that, but it, there, it's just a weird, this is a weird year for the Red Sox. Like we're even, even a guy like Rafael Devers, who's supposed to be more of a rock for us in the lineup. He's been, in and out you don't know if he's going to play that day so when you got guys like that it's 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 tough to really latch on but then you you go out and you watch cutter crawford just dice an entire lineup up and down and then it's like okay we're back but so as i i don't know to be honest with you i don't i don't know where we go <laughs> from here after this sweep again i hope i hope this was a an opportunity for the offense at the very least to figure it out because we know what the pitching's been doing um but we just need we need these guys who you don't really know what you're going to get night in and night out to to um, to find something that works that builds a little bit of that confidence and that they can string together so they can put up some crooked numbers night in and night out and and help out the pitching because we know that this pitching is not going to last for like we're not going to be leading the league uh, in in pitching all year we're we're we've been blessed thus far with, with an incredible rotation uh, or an incredible effort from the rotation. But we know that that the way baseball works, the law of averages, we're not going to see us all year. So by the time that they start to flounder a little bit, you're going to need the offense to bail them out because the pitching for the most part has been doing the bailing out. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping, like I said, we can keep, keep up the, the good work on the road when we head to Cleveland. What's the, what's the, expected return from Tyler O'Neill. Was this just a concussion? Is there more to it than that? Dude, they hit hard. Uh, he he was yeah, that I mean that was an ugly, ugly uh spill between him and him and Devers, but and he obviously took the the brunt of that. But mm -hmm. um he I I did see he was taking BP today. So I, I think he um uh, I actually didn't catch what the update was post game from Cora on that. But you talk um, about starting a season on a heater. I mean, my goodness! I, the, I think it was uh, for for the national baseball fans out there who follow uh, Jared Carabas. He he had put out a tweet that I thought was funny. He he had tweeted that Tyler O'Neill had hit a home run on I think it was three opening days this year. He hit, or maybe it was was it four opening days? Or no, no, no it was three opening days. We because we opened the season in Seattle. He hit one there, and then he hit one I believe in Oakland their opening day. And then he hit one uh, in in uh, at Fenway for the for the Sox opening day. So it was um, it was great to see him have that start. Um, but you know, if if he's on the IL, you're not getting that production. So you got to find it from somebody else. Right. Going to reload your video here for a second. It seems to be frozen. I still have your audio though. So oh, that's weird. we're good until that comes back. Um, yeah. So we're familiar with him. There we go. There we go. Uh, we're familiar with him, obviously all those years in St. Louis. It was funny. Cause we had <laughs> with the two sweeps, 
we had Bader running them down uh, for the Mets and then just missed O'Neill. But I was like, man, we're going to do this. And he was on fire. The thing about O'Neill is I think he's played 100 games once in his career. So it, you yeah, know, you which, take it while you can get it. Exactly. Yeah, that was that was the narrative coming into the season. But it's it's hard to pay attention to that when he's hitting the way he is. You're going, yeah. I'm just going to close my ears and pretend that I don't hear that. <laughs> and we're just going to ride this out as long as we can. And sure enough, and it wasn't even like, it was just a freak. It was a freak play. It wasn't, it wasn't like he, you know, he was laying out and hyperextended something. It was just, you know, it was just a freak miscommunication uh, that, that led to that. So I'm, I'm not going to look too much into it. It's unfortunate that it, it just it reinforces that narrative of uh, him just being a, a constant presence on the IL. But uh, I I think uh, or I'm hopeful rather that when he gets back that he can just pick up right where he left off because uh, well, obviously it, this has nothing to do with him, right? I mean, this is just like this isn't right. like oh I got a sore arm or I tweaked right. something in exactly. my back or yeah, it's hamstring problem. Like those are things that you. You know what I mean? You can say like this guy's just, but I mean like they collided. There's not, that's a completely different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to look too much into that element of it. It, it sucks. Yeah. That he's missing time, but um, the, I, I think there are other guys that can fill in. I mean, I, I, I would have said uh, Tristan obviously, but he's, yeah. he just hit the shelf. Uh, but a guy yeah. that, seemingly uh picked it up this weekend will you he had he'd been off to a little bit of a slow start but it seemed that it goes back to what i was saying is uh this this series serving as sort of a launching point uh confidence wise for some of these guys so if a guy like will your can can um can keep this this train rolling offensively from a personal standpoint i think that's huge Connor Wong has been has been great behind the dish or offensively at least. Uh, he's been swinging a hot bat, um, and you just need you just need Devers to get it going. I mean he's he's gonna put up he's gonna put up thirty and a hundred in his sleep, but you just need him you need him out there. You need him getting consistent abs because if it's again if it's a, a thing where he's waking up each morning going I don't know if my my shoulders feeling I don't know if my knee is feeling it today then it's gonna be hard to to have the rest of that lineup going because as as you could very well guess when you have Rafael Devers going the rest of the lineup is going because that's that's the guy that those uh those other players look to 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 get that spark going so yeah and on the Pittsburgh side we welcome the Milwaukee Brewers to town so for four for four games and they're four straight wins now First place in the division, fourteen and six. We were neck and neck for, for a while till we till we kind of fell out, but it's not going to get any easier <laughs> from from this standpoint. And uh, not that you would ever expect it to, but like you know, every once in a while, it'd be nice to just oh, we've got Oakland <laughs> or we've got Colorado, but you know, it's we do have Oakland next week, but not. Well, that goes back to what I was saying. You oh, guys, no. you were supposed to have that with the Boston Red Sox, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what juice they were drinking on the flight to Pittsburgh, but there's something something switched, and they proved to not be a such a rollover that I was I was expecting them to be in in Pittsburgh. But yeah, that's that's a tough that's a tough team to follow up a, a surprising sweep because I I would venture to say most Pirates fans probably didn't see this weekend playing out the way it did. But now the reality is it did. Mm-hmm. So you have to look at what's next. And right. yeah, the Brewers, that's a that's a tough, that's a tough uh follow up to a rough weekend. Right. And we had a, a rough week even, but we had just taken the series from from Baltimore for the opening series at home, heading to Philly, thinking, okay, we've got Philly, then we've got the Mets. Let's let's split in Philly and let's go take a series from the Mets. And then see where we're at, right? And then you do split the series, and then it just what you don't realize that far in advance is all of a sudden the Mets are hot. They're seven and three in their last ten. They sweep us, and everybody says, "Well, we lost to the Mets," but they're out there beating the. the uh, did they beat the Dodgers? Did they sweep them? Uh, well, they're still playing. To, you, yeah, 
You're talking the Mets. The Mets. They're still playing yeah. the Dodgers, but they're. I mean, they're about to sweep the Dodgers. If I, I don't know where they're. The game. Well, did they lose? I think they lost. Oh, yesterday, they got crushed. Didn't they? No, yeah, they got crushed yeah. today. Or it was today. Okay. Yeah. yeah they I need lost to refresh today. my my page here that says they've won six in a row because yeah, they've now not won six in a row. Yeah. They just yeah, lost. But today. I mean, they're they're twelve and nine with that run they had there. Yeah. Uh, that kind of bled into last week. They're twelve and nine, eight and two in their last ten. So I mean, they're. I mean, they're yeah, and, and, and the early going at least they're no joke. So right, and they've only played teams that are over five hundred. So I mean, they're you know to take it to where you say like, oh yeah, but we lost to the Mets and the Red Sox, and it's like yeah, but the Red Sox played well. Not that it, I mean, we lost by large margins. I mean, except for except for Saturday, but we played so poorly. It didn't even feel like had we even played well, <laughs> we come out of there with a win. You know what I mean? And that's kind of the thing is, uh, you know, it's going to swing this way. And and the funniest baseball thing that could happen is go t- win three out of four against Milwaukee because it's very possible. <laughs> Dude, I don't know what's going on in baseball. And again, not to keep reiterating and rehashing, and I, I but that I know it's early, but baseball is – seemingly flipped on its head right now. I mean, you've got you've got the Rays who in their sleep can manufacture 90 wins. They're at the bottom of the division, albeit they're yeah. sitting over 500 right now, which again <laughs> proves my point. Right. Um you've got the Guardians, the Royals and the Tigers at the top of the cent- or you know, like on the the upper half of the central there. Uh, you've got the Houston Astros, seven and sixteen, yeah. sitting in the basement of the AL West. Don't know what's going on there. Um, you've got the Mets, as we just got done talking about playing mm-hmm. better ball than I think uh, was expected uh, out of the gate. You've got the Cardinals, who were expected to be a much better uh, contender than last year proved. They're sitting at the bottom of the division. So there's just a right. whole lot of uh backwards narratives being formed in the early going here. So it to your point, it would not surprise me if Pittsburgh <laughs> goes out and takes three or four or even sweeps the Brewers. Uh, yeah, that would say that that would there'd be a parade in the streets. But no, I you know the thing is is I think uh I think that the Brewers being where they are right now is probably more surprising than the Cardinals being where they are right now. Yeah. But yeah. It, it, you know it's it's that way. I mean the Reds the Reds have come up at the same time that the Pirates have gone down, and they've kind of they've kind of flip flopped their spots now, and it's just it is it's crazy. I let me see Diamondbacks losing record. Other than that, that they're pretty. much... I mean, the Dodgers are only thirteen and eleven, and that's you know with yeah, what I, they are. I mean, that's you know that's a thing too, but. There's a there's a lot of truth, and I know he got a he got a lot of uh, he caught a lot of flack for it. But there's a lot of truth to what Mookie Bet said uh, back in the off season, and it, it was very misunderstood, I think, by a lot of people. A lot of people took that quote and ran with it, but he was talking about how every whenever teams match up with the Dodgers this year, it's going to be their their World Series, and yeah. so now every time that a team beats the Dodgers or something, that quote's thrown back in his face. I'm like, that's not what he's saying. He's simply saying that the teams are going to have the Dodgers marked on their calendars, whether they're home on the road, whatever it is, when they meet with the Dodgers, that's going to be a massive deal. And I think uh, one can only assume that because of that, the Dodgers are going to get every team's best because of Mm -hmm. course you want to beat the Dodgers when you, when you face the Dodgers. So quite frankly, even, even as, as uh, loaded as that, that roster is and that lineup is one through nine. And I know they've had their, their question marks surrounding the rotation. Even then uh, you would think that they would, they'd be uh, playing pretty well, but quite frankly, I'm not surprised that their record reflects a little bit more of a, uh, a beaten up start to the season, because I I just think that you're going to, the Dodgers are going to be up against it all year because you're going to get every team's best, regardless Mm -hmm. who it is. I mean, that's what, probably even even Boston to a certain extent, but like the Yankees are always in that camp. You always play. Everybody always wants to play the Yankees well. I was yeah. actually looking to see how Baltimore would respond to that this year because I thought that that would be something that people would go up against Baltimore and say, we got to bring it. 
because this team's no joke, but I mean, they're still doing well with it. So I think there is a lot of that, 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 I mean, he's certainly right. It's been that way for a long time with the Dodgers. You know what I mean? You're always going to do that where you might not uh, play as hard against when you're going up against Oakland. You're like, Hey, let's get through this thing. Let's do our job. Let's, let's win a series. Let's, you know what I mean? But it's totally different. I remember um, whether it was a year or two ago, I and mean, the Pirates were what would have been, I think it was two years ago, Pirates were, when I mean, we knew they weren't going to be good. They're in the middle of a rebuild. We knew exactly what that roster was going to be. And Bednar throws like a two-inning save to finish off the sweep in L.A. And it was the highlight of the entire season. Because we went to LA and we swept the Dodgers, knowing all well that we were that we were on our way to a hundred losses, and you know, but for us that was it. You know what I mean? And so it's a hundred percent real. So it is what it is. Hey man, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, Absolutely. Get to hear sometimes. Like I've thought about doing this before, and I've got some friends um, who are Reds fans who live near me and everything, and I thought. We had to have some. We did it last year with a, a buddy of mine who's a Phillies fan. He's from Philly. Had him on to talk about the series with the Phillies, and so I was like, "Man, this this would be something I want to do this year is get some fans on and talk." So we get to hear from another point of view a little bit, rather than me just, especially right after back to back sweeps. I could have just I could have just released Thursdays again and just dubbed Mets and just dubbed, put Red Sox in over Mets <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and just said and just had all the dubs in there. Uh, but no, I. Uh, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, take a second to to tell because you're you guys are all baseball. You're not a Red Sox podcast. You guys talk everything. So take a second to tell all of the Pirates fans that are listening to this and might not know where to find you. Yeah. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, we we are the three O Take. We talk uh, all things uh, MLB. We are on in season twice a week. Uh, and in the off season, we, we drop it down to once a week, just because, as you know, things get a little slow in the winter, in the, in the dead do. of winter. Uh, but we have we have a good time on there, man. We we talk, uh, we we do our best to to make our rounds across the league, even the teams that you know are struggling or maybe don't get the same kind of shine as uh, some of the more mainstream, bigger market teams out there. We 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 try to do our best. Uh, to cover all the the main storylines that are floating around out there, because we we recognize that. Um, the things that are, are are being talked about around the league are more often times or more often than not the things people are going to want to hear different points of view about, and uh, we 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 try to we we do our best to um, be as uh, objective as we can on on things, but we can't help but but uh, let our opinion show on on others. So it's a it's a good mix. We we've got some good chemistry on there. Nate and I have been uh, we've been friends. On, I mean, we were neighbors when we were like toddlers. So we've we've known each other since I mean for as long as I can remember. Uh, we just love baseball. He's a Yankees guy. I'm a, obviously a Red Sox guy. Um, and I, I think, I think we, it's so ingrained in us now that we almost don't talk about the Red Sox and Yankees as much as we probably would, but we try to, we try to make it a point to not just make it a Red Sox Yankees podcast. So like I said, we, we, we love just baseball in general. So we love talking different teams, different players, uh, and really just whatever's buzzing around the baseball world at that time. So, uh, check us out. We are, uh, it's a three out take. As I said, you can find us wherever you listen to podcasts, um, Instagram, we're on there, Facebook, we're on there. Uh, and I actually, I actually just made the switch on Twitter. So we used to, we used to be on Twitter as well, but I have since taken that on as a, as a personal account. So you can follow me there. It's uh, at Kyle Corwin takes, uh, and then Nate's on, on Twitter as well. You can find Tim. I believe he's, uh, nay seven Ray. N a y seven r e y I believe you may have to check me on that, but he's on there as well. <laughs> yeah, seven uh, n a y r e y. Yeah, so there, so there you go. He's on there. Uh, so would love to have you uh, check us out. We we definitely talk pirates. In fact, it's funny. It's funny you mentioned that about us talking all things baseball. I actually am looking at my soundboard right now, and the pirates are the only team that has a designated sound effect for. It. I've got a little pirates music like 
style background music that we like to cue up every now and then <laughs> yeah. when the pirates are buzzing. And we, I usually just, I'll, I'll give like a good one to two minute rant to the, the tune of this pirates music that I've got on my soundboard. So uh, if for whatever that's worth, uh, check us out and we would love to have you add our podcast to your queue in addition to the bridge to Bucktober podcast. Love it. I listen to it uh, every week, so I love it. So it's a good. We appreciate it. So, so I guess you could say, uh, don't let the Red Sox Yankees thing uh, kind of keep you away, because that is true. You guys don't just talk about it, but when they're doing bad, you can't help. Oh <laughs> There's yeah, a- <laughs> no. I mean, we, we we feel like that's a fair compromise. Yeah. Like we're, when they're doing well, we're not gonna we're not gonna harp on it, but yeah. we take our opportunities because we know we know that people like hearing about the. <laughs> the big bad Yankees and Red Sox <laughs> getting beat up a little bit. So we, we kind of lean into that from time to time. So if, if you like hearing uh, self-deprecating Red Sox and Yankees fans talk, maybe, maybe, maybe <laughs> check us out. So, And when the pirates are going good, you got to tune in for the, hey, we, for the montage. We, I tell you what, man, I, I love hyping the pirates up. I'm, I, as I mentioned, I got family up, up there in Pennsylvania. So, and I've been to a, a number of pirates games. I think, PNC. Well, I know PNC is a top three ballpark in baseball and it has been since it was created. So, um, I, I love what they, what the pirates have going on up there. Um, I, I, like I said, if I could leave you pirates fans with one thing, it's what I said earlier that there is light at the end of the tunnel. I, and again, I'll say it, I don't know how long that tunnel is, but it's there. So just you know, just ride out the ride out the storm. You guys, you guys will be back on top in no time. I believe it. You heard it here, and I didn't have there to say go. it this time. <laughs> yeah, I was not. I was not paid to to close out with that. I said, uh, "Hey, you can come on if you if you throw a bunch of love." I'm no, kidding. No, that's that's my belief. <laughs> uh, of course, a lot of a lot of uh, right decisions have to be made. A lot of maybe hard decisions have to be made, but I, I think there's plenty to be excited about. Um, but you know, maybe some personnel changes are in order. Maybe some, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think I fill in the blank. I, I think, yeah. you, I think you, you all know what needs to happen in order for this, this train to get moving, but it's, I think you guys are laying a good foundation there. So, and even, and, and I say foundation, I think this, this year isn't necessarily going to be a, a, a throw, throwaway season. I think it's going to be a, 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 a fun hundred and, 40 games, however many we've got left, 140 games oh, yep. left. I think it's going to be fun, uh, fun baseball to watch in Pittsburgh. So, yep. All right. That's all we have for today. Cue the music. We'll get out of here and uh, appreciate you guys listening. Let's go, Bucks. Thanks for listening to my dad and Uncle Jake on the Bridge to Bucktober podcast. Follow them on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Bridge the Number Two October. Don't forget to subscribe so you know when new episodes are released. Clear the deck, cannonball coming, and let's go, Bucks!